You are listening to Announce. Season 6, Episode 31. Was Dr. Jekyll real? Robert Louis Stevenson, in his mid-30s, had contracted a persistent lung infection and an accompanying fever. Not a new experience for him. He seemed to be sickly his whole life. But this infection was bad enough that he and his wife relocated in 1884 to Dorset on the English coast. The author remained exhausted for months. He had great difficulty in getting restful sleep. And when he did sleep, he was plagued by nightmares. As he slept and the frightful dreams came, he would thrash and groan. On one occasion, as he cried out during one of these episodes, his watchful wife, attempting to comfort him, woke him. And to her surprise, he scolded her. In a strange way, the state of mind he found himself in during the terrors of sleep were of great value to him. These nightmares became, for Stevenson, a type of research, a way to explore his mind, to connect with thought and creativity, to revisit slivers of information and experience. And from this disturbing patchwork, he was composing his next work. Strange Case Robert Louis Stevenson's next work was the classic The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Stevenson's wife, Fanny, reported to have said that during this time of illness and night terrors, he had been deeply engrossed in an article in a scientific journal about the hidden side of the human mind, the subconscious part, with its hidden desires and machinations, and that the ideas from this article along with the memories of a real and rather remarkable character, Deacon Brody, along with his own tortured and creative mind, well, that's where he got the inspiration to write the tale. The odd life of the real character whom Jekyll and Hyde was based was Deacon Brody. Brody was a rather remarkable, unusual, and yes, very strange case. It seems Deacon Brody was a distinguished and trusted gentleman of status who chose, or was somehow compelled by the demons in his own mind, to live a rather duplicitous life. Deacon Brody was a respected businessman, a city councillor, a cabinet maker, and a locksmith, who was always dressed in his finest and who was always present at the best social events. On the surface, he lived a respectable life with a wife and children. But he also lived a secret life, filled with gambling, drunkenness, and cockfighting, and two mistresses and five illegitimate children. The Two Lives of Deacon Brody Brody was very successful at keeping his two lives separated. Apparently, the two disparate social circles he moved in, did not intersect. This second hidden life was expensive. He had expenses in the losses on his bets on the cockfights and other gambling debts. He had to keep the entertainment budget funded in order to keep the liquor flowing. And supporting two additional illegitimate families was not cheap. The expenses were more than enough to have drained Brody's resources and caused a need for him to find an additional source of income. Thus, he started a new nocturnal career as one of Edinburgh's finest burglars in this role. As a fine cabinet maker and a locksmith, Deacon Brody had the complete trust of the most noble households, a trust he betrayed by making his own copies of their keys. And for over 20 years, these keys that he made gave him access to the most valuable stuff in town. You might say Deacon Brody had the keys to the city. Eventually the jig was up. He and a few accomplices botched the robbery of the excise office. 
Brody fled, but was caught, tried, and convicted. And it was quite a scandal. How could such a fine, trusted, and upright citizen get away with living a second life of debauchery and theft? <laughs> On the 1st of October, 1788, at the age of 47, Deacon Brody was hanged in the old Tollbooth Jail. Brody arrived for his execution in high spirits and was, of course, wearing his best and most stylish suit of clothing. Interestingly, the Tollbooth Jail had recently installed a highly effective and efficient new gallows, one that guaranteed its victims a sure, quick, and clean breaking of the neck. None of this kicking and struggling or just popping off the head with the body dropping to the ground. A gallows designed by the innovative and brilliant cabinet maker Deacon Brody. <laughs> there are several small measures or ounces of wisdom to be found in the story behind this classic Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There is much to be gleaned from this carefully woven examination of the civilized creature and the beast that live in each of us. But may I suggest an ounce? Just one, among many, for your review. We all go through our lives wearing a mask. A mask that we choose. That shows us in the way we think we want to be perceived. There are those whose mask is minimal, sincere, real, and quite genuine. And then there are others for whom the mask is a complete deception, projected to deceive, or to hide, or to pretend. Why is there a mask? because all of us have within us a struggle. A struggle with the duality of who we are, that we don't want to share with the world. There is a part that seeks good, that is generous, that wants to lift. This positive portion of us exists and is opposed to all the selfish, angry, vindictive, and frightened parts of us. In a way, we all have both Jekyll and Hyde within us. The poised between the two is an awareness of an ability to choose, an agency which makes us responsible to act and think and believe. So, here's the ounce. An acceptance that you are the captain of your own ship. You are in charge of you, yourself. But we are within a world with winds and currents that we do not control. We are, however, responsible for how we set our sails and how we turn the rudder. We are agents unto ourselves. And that's it. An ounce submitted for your consideration. Well, thanks for watching again. Really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please take the time to like and share and subscribe. <laughs> and let other people know we're around. That's how we convince the algorithms that we're worth watching. And we need your help for that. Thanks.